Okay, this video is going to cover what we know as in our unit of study now as Unit 5, Lesson 2. And I should have put that on the top of this, but I didn't. And basically what I've done is combined uh, or taken parts of two different sections of the book um, so that you have that resource with you. So that And so that's why I have the book number on here so that you can see where it's coming from if you want to go look at it in the book. Okay, but it's a continuation of what we did um, in our lesson one of this unit when we did exponential regression. And we talked a lot about this formula here of y equals a times b to the x. And I'm hoping that you can recognize, okay, this is the one that looks like the function that we did with our uh, exponential regression. And that, of course, is exponential growth because our numbers are getting bigger. Okay, so my blue line is exponential growth. And that is when the value of b, which is everything that we had yesterday, was larger than 1. Okay, now if your b value is less than 1, but it can never be less than 0, so it always has to be greater than 0, then we have what is called exponential decay. And you can see the graph. What's happening is it is getting smaller and smaller. But both of these graphs, um, if you can see, and when I talked about it in class, I mentioned that if you walked half the distance to the wall every time, so every point on the graph you'd go half, and then you go half again, and then half again, and then half again. And obviously you're going to touch it because we can't physically get small enough, but if you used a microscope, you would keep getting halfway to the distance of that line, but you would actually never touch that line. And what we do is we call that line an asymptote. And so in this graph, both of these graphs, if you look at it this way, or you're looking at it this way, the graph approaches the x-axis, but never touches it. And we call that x-axis an asymptote, or the equation is y equals 0. So just to make sure you know what that is, an asymptote is basically a line. We usually dot that line in the graph because it's not part of the equation. It's just something that helps us in graphing. It's a line that a graph approaches but never touches. For now, you're going to learn more about them, um, and you will learn more aspects of them. But for our purposes right now, that's how we're going to define a line that a graph approaches but never touches. So in this case, the x-axis is our asymptote. Okay. Sometimes that's hard to see, so if I have an asymptote that's on an axis, I like to write that equation y equals 0 on there. Okay. So look at what kind of things you need to be able to answer. Identify each function or situation as an example of exponential growth or decay and what is the y-intercept. So when I look at this, okay, what I'm looking for is my b value and here you can see that b is equal to 4 and that value is greater than 1. So since this is greater than 1, this is an example of exponential growth. Okay, what is the y-intercept? The y-intercept, I like to write it, that's when x equals 0. So if you plugged in 0, 4 to the 0 is 1, 1 times 3 is 3. But we talked about it a lot with our um, exponential regression equations yesterday in our unit, um, is that this is that initial amount, and that initial amount is when time was 0. So it's that same kind of thing. Okay, so look at the next one. y equals 11 times 0.75 to the x. Okay, again, whatever number is with the variable x, that's what makes it an exponential function. So b is equal to 0.75, and that number is less than 1, so this is an example of decay. It is exponential decay, and my y-intercept is going to be 0, 11. And this last one, you put $2,000 into a college savings account for four years, the account pays 6% annually. So if they're paying you 6% annually, hopefully you can understand that that means I definitely have growth. And what is my y-intercept? Well, my y-intercept is what I start out with initially. So that's going to be 0, 2,000. Okay. And what I pointed out in class, because I want you all to see, because it's tied in so much to what we were doing earlier, 
um, is we knew that if the number was larger than one that I have growth or if it's less than one I have decay so something to keep in mind okay when I talk about growth okay and um, in our previous lesson if I had an equation and it was something like um, let's go with 4.42 times 1.14 to the X okay y'all knew this was the initial amount and you knew that this was our um, our B uh, it's our B in the problem but when you told me what the growth rate was you said we did 1.14 and I told you to find the difference between it and 1 which was 0.14 and then we changed that to a percent, which meant that our growth rate was 14%. So when you look at this one, if the number inside is 4, then I'm going to find the difference between 4 and 1, which is 3. And then I have to change that to a percent. So whether you move the decimal over two places or multiply that number by 100, this becomes 3 hundred percent so that is the growth rate that's the rate how do we put it in our formula is we change it to a decimal and add one to it or in this case um, I'm always what you always want to think of is you find the difference between it and one so I'm going to do one minus 0.75 here and that of course would equal 0.25 so if you changed it if you did if you subtracted one like I did over here y'all you would get 0.715 minus 1 well that would give you a negative 0.25 and that's fine but just know that the negative means it's decay or you can just not have to worry about it and just subtract it so you get a positive number either way this 0.25 becomes 25 percent so this particular function has a 300 percent growth rate this particular function has a 25 percent decay rate what does this one have well, hopefully you can see it does have a 6% growth rate. So more importantly, how does that translate into our equation? Is we say y equals my initial amount, which was 2,000, times 1 plus my rate. And that rate, remember, as a decimal is that. So it would be 1.06 to the x. And that would be the equation go along with it. So I wanted you to see how this number relates to our rate, and hopefully that will help you understand your exponential growth formula. Okay, since we've been doing that, this is our formula. Okay, a of t equals little a parentheses one plus r raised to the t. Okay, so what do you need to remember about that? First of all, this is notation. Okay, you do not divide by t or whatever number that you is. It just tells us the amount that we have after t time periods okay then you have r as your rate of growth it's usually given to you as a percent and you need to change that to a decimal okay if you need help change a percent to decimal come see me okay growth remember r if r is greater than zero or they say r is less than zero but we know if this whole thing is more than one we have growth and if it's less than one then we have decay okay the initial amount we're used to that we've talked about that um, in our previous lesson but what I want to point out here is the number of time periods and time periods that's your units of time and that can be minutes it could be seconds it could be weeks it could be I should say weeks uh, it could say months it could say years but it could change the whole point is in an exponential and growth um, formula you got to pay attention to that to the units of time making sure that they're the same and they could be any unit of measure for time okay so let's look at some of the problems we'll have uh, suppose you invest five hundred dollars in a savings account that pays three and a half percent annual interest how much will the account have after five years so I like to go through the problem and identify what each number this five hundred dollars is going to be my initial amount so that's the little a three and a half percent annual interest is my r but i have to change that to a decimal so that becomes 0 
and how much account will be in the account after five years, and that's my T. So when I write it, that's A of 5, and that's equal to 500, times 1 plus 0 0.035 raised to the 5. So that was A times 1 plus R to the T. Okay, I only really want you to put that in your calculator in one fell swoop. And when you do that, you're going to get, okay, pause if you need to, but you want to make sure that you get $593.84. We're talking money, so we usually carry it out to dollars and cents. Okay, put it all in one fell swoop, then that's what you should get. Okay, so look at the next problem. Suppose you invest $500 in a savings account that pays 3.5% annual interest. Same thing we just had. However, this time, when will the account contain at least $650? Okay, so this time, we still have this is my initial amount. This is still my R at 0 0.035. But this is not my time. It's actually the amount that I have after a certain amount of time that I don't know what it is. So that means I'm going to plug it in for the left side, and I still have the right side, 1 plus 0 0.035, but I'm looking for the T. So, you have two ways to do this at this point in our class, because we haven't learned everything about solving all kinds of equations. So the way that we have to solve this now, we have two different methods of solving. One is either your intersect method, we will be using a graphing calculator, or one is your zero method, okay? Now, intersect method means leave it just like that, and you put in F1 equals 650, graph it, F2 equals this function, and you graph it. And on your calculator, instead of a T, you put an X, because it always graphs in terms of X and Y, okay? Now, in the other method, if I choose the zero method, which I kind of like better, and I'll explain that in a second, I'm going to take the 650 to the other side, so that means I'm going to have 0 equals 500 times 1 plus 0 0.035 to the T, or the X on your calculator, minus 650. Okay, so that means now I'm going to go to my graphing calculator, which we're going to pull up right here. My menu, I'm going to add a graph, uh, and i got to turn off my Smart Ink. So I can actually use it. There we go. Add a graph. And so I'm going to type in, we had 500, parentheses, 1, plus 0 0.035, close the parentheses, um, carrot, raise it up to the X. Okay, so we're putting an X and not a T. Then you're going to come back down. And subtract 650. So when I plot it, boom, there it is. So we have it. Now, with the zero method, the difference is, okay, I want to show this to you real quick. So you have this method or you have that method. If you use this method, okay, and your point of intersection of your two graphs doesn't show up in this window, you got to go find it. And you might not know where that is, okay? However, if you use the zero method, then if your graph doesn't show up in your window, you just have to change your x-axis to find out because we're looking for the zeros of our function. And that's why I think that's a little bit easier to find if the graph turns out to, the zeros turn out to be outside of your graphing window. Okay? So, and again, to change that, you can just click on the number there and type a new one. I can type 15 if I need to. Or you can use your menu button and go to the window settings. Okay? Regardless, we have to find the zeros. So we do that by clicking on menu and then analyze and zero. And we have a left bound, lower bound, and an upper bound, and that is a zero of my function. So I'm going to go back and type in, basically when I solved it, t was equal to 7.63. So to answer the question, when will the uh, account contain at least $650, you could say at 7.63 years, but I think when you answer the questions in the book, um, they round it. So you would need to say after 8 years, because you can't say 
um, if you go to the nearest year, after seven years, it's not exactly it. You have to go all the way to eight years to get to that complete year. But either one of those answers um, will work. Okay? All right. So what we just talked about was exponential growth and decay, and those were happening at certain periods. Okay? Um, in real life, it doesn't always happen that way. Okay, so we have another function that we use with exponents, and it is called the natural base exponential function. Okay, natural, it's really called the natural base because, y'all, that's what really happens in nature. Things grow, and what are we using it for? It's because they're used to describe continuous growth and decay. When you're growing or wildfires are spreading or diseases are spreading, they, they grow continuously. There is not a um, definite start and stop. It's uh, you're not 5'5 five, five one day and then the next week you're exactly 5'6. There is a gradual growth that happens over your lifetime. And what is this natural base that we have? It is called E. Okay, E, it's named after, and before you say Euler, it's pronounced Euler. It is, uh, Euler was a Swiss mathematician who was credited with discovering using the letter E. It was named after him. So that's why we have that letter. And it is an irrational number. We'll talk more about it. If you want to know more about it, come see me. But it's an irrational number like pi. There is a decimal approximation for it. But what, uh, and we'll get into that later, but right now, what I need to do is make sure that you know how to use that on your calculator. So, we have e to the 8th. So, on your calculator, um, and scientific's a little bit different. I can't show scientific, so I'm going to show um, the Inspire. But I have to go to a new page because I'm going to do calculations. So, add a calculator page. And my E button is right here. So, if I want e to the 8th, it pops up just like that, and I just type in my 8 and it gives me a number. Now, if your calculator spit back at you, e to the 8, just hit control and enter, and you see above it the little squiggly lines, then it'll give you this decimal approximation. So, 2980.96. So, that's what you should get when you put this in. 2980.86. Okay. Now, the next example that I put on here was, what is 1 over e to the third? Okay, and that's not such a problem to do on the Inspire because it's so easy to put the fractions. But on Scientific Calculator, I find a lot of people make mistakes with it. So, I want to point out to you, if you remember from our previous chapters that we've studied, that 1 over e to the third is the same thing as e to the negative 3. So, when you go back, and you put in, you can type in E and type in negative 3 and get a number. Or on the Inspire, you can just put in the fraction and put 1 over E to the third. Both of them will give you the same. So we got 0 .49787, 0 .0. So this was 0 .049787, and that's the approximation. Okay? So... And why is that so important? Well, first of all, we need to know E. We'll learn more about it as we continue. But what's most important about it is it is used in functions that represent continuous growth or decay. So that leads us to our next formula that we have for continuously compounded interest. Okay? There is such a thing. It happens a lot in real life. Okay? And it uses this formula that a lot of people refer to as PERT. So I hope you all can see why it's called PERT, P-E-R-T, okay? We still have the same thing um, with our notation, okay? This is just the amount of money that we have at time T. Our interest rate is still um, given to us as a percent, and we have to change it to a decimal. Um, and interest rates are more times than not given to you in annual terms, okay? P is the principle here because that's what we always refer to with money. But if you think about it and refer, referring back to our exponential function, it's the same thing as A. So if you can remember that, that's your initial amount that you start with. 
okay? And as I mentioned before, the time is always in years. So if you had six months, you would not put six for t, you would put t is equal to 0.5 or one half, okay? So that's the thing that you gotta be careful about when you're dealing with um, money formulas, compound interest, okay? So when you read a problem, suppose you won a contest at the start of ninth grade that deposited uh, $3,000 in an account, pays 5% annual interest, compounded continuously. You start college four years later, spend four years in college, how much will be in the account at the end of four years? Okay, the most important part about this formula is the fact that it has this word right here in it, continuously. If you see the word continuously, then you know that you have to use PERT. Okay, so to go use this, uh, deposited $3,000, that's my initial amount, so that's my P. An account that pays 5% interest, that's my R. And as a decimal, that would be 0 0.05. You start college four years later, spend four years in college, how much would be in the account after four years of college? So I am trying to figure out how much money I have after eight years, because I have four years of high school and four years of college. So I have A of eight is equal to the principal, which is 3,000. E to the R, which is 0 0.05, and that doesn't look like a 5, sorry, 0 0.05 times T is 8. Okay, again, on an Inspire, that's not a problem to put in your calculator, but if you have a scientific calculator, you absolutely must put parentheses around that, or you will get the wrong answer. So please put this in your calculator, and make sure that you know how to do this if you are watching this video. All right, so when you put that in, you should get on your calculator $4,475.47. So, that is the end of this, Unit 5, Lesson 2, which covers parts of 7.1 and 7.2 in our textbook. If you have any questions, please come see me.